It's the power. Holy water. Oh! The Exorcist is one of the rare movies to invent and perfect a genre in one fell swoop. If you've seen any movies involving demonic possession at all, then you've probably seen some spooky girl contorting herself into spine-stretching poses, taunting some holy man who is invoking God's name at the top of his lungs. But after nearly 50 years of being imitated and satirized, The bed is on my foot! The bed is on my foot! I think what remains totally unique about The Exorcist is in the world around its characters. This is a movie that is every bit as interested in the human world in the background of Chris and Reagan's story as the actual demon. Really, that's where The Exorcist himself spends most of his time. So rather than exhaustively covering all the scares we know by heart, let's venture outside that infamous bedroom and see what we can learn from how the natural world echoes the supernatural, how the miseries and mysteries of the background invades the foreground, and how Father Karras gets caught in the middle. Billy and I got together before the film in pre-production and we talked about the look of the film. And we both agreed that it should look as realistic as possible but because if the audience believed that what they were seeing was actually happening and they weren't uh, distracted by the fact that maybe there was cameras and lights and different kinds of lenses and funny angles and things like that, but we just kept it ordinary, that it would work better. Welcome to Acolytes of Horror, where we examine the horrors of life through the horrors of film. My name is Nathan, and tonight I'm scared of William Friedkin's the Exorcist. So that clip we just watched was from an interview with The Exorcist's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant cinematographer, Owen Roisman. From what I've been able to find, when Roisman or Friedkin are asked about this movie's visual aesthetics, they always say something like, we wanted the movie to look realistic so that audiences would find the demon believable. But what does realism look like? Or Maybe a better question, how does The Exorcist want realism to make us feel? Because right before The Exorcist, Friedkin and Roisman made The French Connection, a film that is so dedicated to realism that it borders on feeling like a documentary at times. But compared to The Exorcist, the editing is snappier, the camera closer. The realism is in service of this feeling of paranoia, the fear that someone is watching you, or the fear that someone is watching you watch them. Outside of the claustrophobic chaos of Reagan's bedroom, I would describe the exorcist's realism as... distant. The movie makes so much time to show characters just walking around. So many long shots of a character slowly emerging out of the background. It makes for a much slower pace. but it also creates this rhythm. For every loud, messy confrontation with demonic perversion, there follows another long, quiet scene out in the normal world where everyone seems to be carrying an invisible burden across an indifferent landscape. They could have easily cut a full minute out of this movie by just having a quick establishing shot of Karis walking into his mother's building here. Yeah, like that. And then bam, cut to the scene. That's what most movies would have done. But instead, he starts way back on the street, then the sidewalk, then the door, then the stairs, then the other door, then the outer room of the apartment, and then the scene. Mama. The Exorcist isn't really about the fear of death 
so much as the despair of decay. So many exorcism movies just cannot resist the temptation to have the demon break loose and kick ass. But the theatrical cut of The Exorcist is so uninterested in those kind of scares. The two people that are killed by the demon actually die off screen because the movie doesn't want to distract from the deeper horror of having to watch someone you love rot. It's the rare horror movie that takes advantage of your empathy instead of your instincts for self-preservation. Instead of, how will I survive this, the characters of The Exorcist ask, how can I endure this? Or more specifically, how can I endure this alone? I think horror is the loneliest genre in Hollywood. It loves to drop its characters out in the middle of nowhere. Torture chambers, cabins in the woods, haunted houses. When someone dies in a horror movie, most of the time they are alone, or at the very least cut off from the rest of society, which makes sense. As individualistic as the Western world likes to think that it is, Things are scarier when we're cut off from the collective. Life-threatening emergencies are always worse if the cell phones are down. Did you find a signal? No, nothing. No one can get a signal up here. Nothing, dude. But the exorcist floods the privacy of the home with doctors, police officers, priests, caregivers, and well-wishers. Chris McNeil is a rich, famous white woman in Washington, D.C. She has access to all the help that the human race has to offer. None of it helps. Her daughter is wasting away, and there doesn't seem to be anything that anyone can do about it. Nor is there really anyone that she confides in or relies on for emotional support. She pays plenty of people to try to help, but she can't pay them to hurt like she hurts. Until Father Karras gets involved halfway through the movie, there's no one to share her pain. The theme of distance goes way beyond something as simple as where the camera is placed. The whole central conflict is that of a daughter being pulled out of her mother's reach. Father Karras' troubles all stem from his mother living too far away for him to take care of her. Reagan's father is so absent that her mother doesn't feel the need to tell him about his daughter's life-threatening condition. The people that Chris turns to for help aren't written as three-dimensional characters so much as institutions. She tries doctors, then psychiatrists, and then the church. She's already seen every fucking psychiatrist in the world and they sent me to you, now you're gonna send me back to them? After Father Karras' mother dies, she appears to him once in a dream and once in a demonic vision. Both times she's depicted as far away or impossible to communicate with. She's faded into the background. And then of course there's the distance between our three main characters. We meet Father Marin all the way out in Iraq during the movie's prologue. Then he disappears for us to meet Chris. Then we finally meet Father Karras nearly 20 minutes into the movie. But he doesn't meet Chris until 80 minutes into the movie. And they don't meet Father Marin until the very end. The movie brings to mind this question of who do you keep in the background of your life? And who do you allow into the foreground? Almost everyone you have ever known started as a figure in the background. Someone small in the distance, walking, becoming closer, less anonymous with every step, until they stood right in front of your face and started talking. In his first shot of the movie, Father Karras is an anonymous face in the literal background of Chris's film set, surrounded by a sea of other nameless faces. You think, who is this happy guy? And that first impression is later proven wrong. In his second shot, he's so enmeshed among all the other extras that it takes a while to pick out who you're supposed to be looking at. Then, when Chris is walking home, and walking home, and walking home, and walking home, and walking home, Father Karras has another fleeting appearance in her periphery. The first time Father Karras is the actual focus of the scene, he walks from the background into the foreground, only for another background character to ask for his help. Father, 
He's hopping all over the place. And look how he reacts. This guy is lit like a demon, but his face is totally neutral. He's just asking for change. One of the first things the movie teaches us about Father Karras is that this is a priest who hates being confronted by the needs of the world around him. We later learn that he's a psychiatrist who no longer feels qualified to lift people out of despair when he himself is so overwhelmed by it. It's more than psychiatry, and you know that, Tom. Some of their problems come down to faith, their vocation, the meaning of their lives, and I can't cut it anymore. He wants to quit his job and maintain a distance from everyone's darkness, the way the rest of us can. All of the on-screen supernatural stuff happens behind closed doors. Unless you hate yourself enough to watch the director's cut. And actually, yeah, people are constantly closing doors in this film. Everyone is working to contain an evil that isn't really trying to escape. There's all these little mysteries that the movie never follows up on, instead inviting us to imagine Reagan's demon sneaking out of the bedroom and scurrying around when nobody's looking. One of my favorite examples of this is something I learned from a Rob Ager video. Chris finds a cross under Reagan's pillow that nobody will admit to putting there. She puts it down to have the scene with Lieutenant Kinderman, and after he leaves, it's gone. Immediately afterwards, the demon throws another fit, and I'm not showing that on YouTube, but yeah, it's creepy. It gives us the impression that the world is full of frolicking demons that we'll never see. Unless, of course, they want us to see. Because if the demon can escape whenever it wants, that means it returns to be locked up and strapped down by choice. Its prison is a stage for it to perform its total mastery over the human race. To laugh in the face of faith in God, in humans, in the world. To laugh at hope. And the guilt-ridden Father Karras is the perfect audience member for such a performance. In fact, in the novel, the first thing the demon ever says to Father Karras is, Well, 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 it's you. They sent you. <laughs> well, we've nothing to fear from you at all. He feels powerless to help his patients the same way he's powerless to help his mother, the same way Chris is powerless to help her daughter. But this mutual misery is ultimately what helps them close this distance. Karis feels so guilty over neglecting his mother that when this new mother comes to him with her own troubles, she immediately becomes more than just a patient to him. Even when Karis is still skeptical, the two characters just immediately feel close to each other, which the usually distant camera also reflects. I especially love this part where Chris is leading Karis into her world as they head for Reagan's bedroom for the first time. This is the moment when Karis goes from despairing at the darkness within himself to fighting the darkness within others. When Father Karis goes to face the demon for the last time, there are no less than three shots of him moving further into the background that he was formerly trying to ignore. Instead of recoiling from the burdens of the world, he becomes one with them and physically escorts them back into the background of Chris and Reagan's lives. The final scene of Chris and the healed Reagan getting the hell out of that house is bookended by two shots of the empty stairwell, a ghostly reminder that Father Karras didn't vanquish evil. He just took it back outside. I know that many Christians are inspired by the metaphor of Father Karras' Christ-like sacrifice, and William Peter Blatty himself has said he wrote The Exorcist to get people to go to church, but I've always found this movie to be a pretty bleak picture of faith. The two priests' belief isn't actually enough to get rid of the demon. I mean, 
Father Marin certainly believed, and it didn't get him anywhere. And Karis doesn't seem to win with God's help either. He just beats the demon up and successfully negotiates with it. Come into me! God damn you! Take me! Only to immediately kill himself after. Not much of a victory, if you ask me. Three people die for one girl to be saved. If we're keeping score, it seems like the devil is winning. And yet, there's a strong suggestion in the movie, which is made explicit in the book, that Father Marin knows he's going to die when he faces the demon, but he goes anyway. Father Marin chooses death rather than walking away from one more suffering soul. As grim as the exorcist is, as much as it says that evil is relentless and maybe it's even winning, it also says that the struggle against it is always worth it. Despair can be isolating, but it can have a way of banding broken people together. In this way, despair will always sow the seeds for its own defeat. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching, and a big thank you to my patrons. This is my first month or so having patrons at all, and so this whole thing is just really new and exciting to me. If you'd like to support my work, feel free to head on over there, or leave me a donation through PayPal. I make a bonus video about a different horror movie each month. Last time we did Army of the Dead, so head on over to Patreon if that sounds interesting to you. My next video will be on American Psycho, so I hope to see you then, and thanks for watching.